Hello and welcome to my audio commentary, feature length commentary of Steve McQueen's film Shame. I'm Omar Moore, a film critic here in San Francisco, California. You see the Fox Searchlight Pictures logo, which is now no longer called Fox Searchlight Pictures. It's now called Searchlight Pictures and the film for logo as well. Shame. It came out in 2011. It was Steve McQueen's second collaboration with Michael Fassbender, the actor that you see here right now lying in bed. Steve McQueen would go on to work with Fassbender again. The two of them had a pretty good collaboration together. They did Hunger. That was the first one they did together. Steve McQueen directing there. Uh, Mr. Fassbender and then Mr. McQueen and Mr. Fassbender again here with Shame. And then 12 Years a Slave as well would be the third film they collaborated on. This film is a film that was set originally in London, and then it was switched over to New York as the setting. And New York is a very vibrant sexual paradise or enterprise, I should say. There's a lot of sexual energy in New York. And here in the New York City subway is a lot of it, strangely enough. You would think that a subway that can be so downright dangerous at times probably wouldn't be a place where you'd find a lot of sexual energy. But when you consider that you know, millions of people travel on the New York City subway every day. You could imagine that there could be a lot of sexual energy and tension. There's also a lot of unwanted energy as well. I should add that. And on this subway car that Michael Fassbender's in, he plays um, the character here, Brandon. He's surveying this scene and he's surveying the people and he sets upon, his gaze sets upon a woman here that you see and all of these memories are kind of colliding together because he's in bed and he's just had sex and he's walking around his apartment naked as we see here and everything in this film is an object it seems so is brandon he's an object i mean he's just touched uh, a button here for his answering machine but it's really a very phallic looking uh, phone and answering machine. It looks like a vibrator, actually, as well as it does a penis. And you will see throughout this film objects touching tangibles. Um, tactile touch is a real uh, central focus of shame. The beholding and the vision, the anticipation, all these kinds of things, uh, objects being touched, being glimpsed, artifacts. That's what Steve McQueen does a lot of. The body, something that Steve McQueen focuses on a lot of his work is the body, the, the corporeal, the idea of the body as a thing that gets harmed or touched or glorified or self-harmed. And you see that and you will see that in this film, Shame, which is an NC-17 rated film here in the United States. This is a woman whose services uh, the Brandon is called upon. She is a I guess she's a sex worker. Some may call her a call girl. I'd call her a sex worker. And so he's directing her to do the kinds of things that he has paid her to do. And so we're seeing that now in this scene. Brandon is a person who is not in touch with his feelings at all. And we'll see that repeatedly here. He barely emotes. He has a slight smile, but he barely emotes in this film until some key moments, of course. Now, she's just put her earrings down and they fall and he's kind of drawn her and you see the earring, the object that I've talked about that Steve McQueen will constantly focus on objects and artifacts throughout this film and the human body, the body. And the, the touch, the, the one finger touch of a button where you see this very phallic looking phone in the answering machine there. And that voice you're hearing is the voice of 
Carrie Mulligan, who plays the sister of Brandon here in Shame. Her name is Sissy, which I find very interesting if you think about the way that that word is used in some parts of uh, culture where you're talking about um, either BDSM or other types of um, behaviors in sexual communities, if you will, for lack of a better phraseology. I mean, we even see Brandon urinating here, all full frontal. And it's the trust that directors and actors have, and the actor has to trust the director. And you see that example here. I don't think Michael Fassbender would have done that for any other director. He is very tight with Steve McQueen. And so Steve McQueen um, has trust uh, and he has trust in Steve McQueen. And we see here Brandon masturbating and then you see the split screen. Uh, I find that an interesting choice from Steve McQueen. I think it's this defragmentation of what he's trying to do. And all of these memories are coming, flooding together. And I like the way that McQueen does this. And now he's truly fixated on this particular person, this woman that he's looking at in the subway car. And if you live in New York or you've spent a lot of time in New York, you know that these things happen. I mean, it happens anywhere, but I can testify to this too. You know, you fix on a person. In my case, you fix on a woman and as a straight man, in my case, and sometimes those eyes lock and sometimes there's something going on there. Sometimes a person looks away and then you look away and you don't bother investing in that moment. But here there are times, and I can say that I've experienced this, where the woman that you may look at may look back at you and there's a flirtation that goes on. And here, this is more than flirtation. This is actually now her, the woman here contemplating her own daydream, perhaps her own fantasy, her own sense of what it might be like to have this male stranger between her legs. And we see her crossing her legs there and flirting her thigh toward Brandon on this subway car in a very packed New York City, a packed subway car, it appears to be. And you can see the longing that she has there, the desire, the longing, and, and he's surveying that rather coldly, but very knowingly. She's totally into him. She totally, uh, and then she kind of catches herself. You notice she catches herself there, um, realizing, should I be doing this? Maybe there's a bit of shame running through her here, you know, but nonetheless, she gets up and she's rectifying her own sense of self-doubt. And that object, the earring we saw before, now the, the, you know, the wedding band, the ring, the wedding ring. And he's gently touched her and she's kind of thinking about whether or not she wants to go through with it, I think. He definitely does. He is clearly pursuing her. And I think that might have been her own sense of shame because she's married, but that won't stop a person, right? You can be married whether you are a male, whether you're female, whether you are uh, trans, you know, although this doesn't happen in equal measure for every community. You, as a human being, you can be married and still have these desires and fantasies and thoughts about complete strangers that you might want to end up going to bed with, end up having sex with. And the moment where she checks herself, the woman there checks herself, kind of snaps back to reality and then feels that it looks like a momentary jolt of shame. And then she walks away and he now has been rebuffed. He can't get to her. Now we're at Brandon's workplace and you see how his boss is kind of projecting something that perhaps that Brandon himself is thinking about being inconsolable and unredeemable and things of that nature. And we see in the right-hand side there for a quick second, Nicole Bahari, the actor, she um, becomes a more prominent part of this narrative. I think what is being talked about here is the voyeurism, the voyeurism culture that we have that YouTube and other 
uh, online entities really brings into the fore in uh, in this time period. And as I said, Shame came out in 2011. But we know that YouTube and all these other social media platforms and video services are now um, the mainstream thing. They're now completely running our lives in some ways. If we want to get famous, all you have to do is post something on YouTube or on Twitter or on Instagram, and that's all she wrote. You notice the monochromatic scheme here. It's this bluish, greenish gray. And these colors are all washed out. And we see that because it looks as if um, it, it represents the symbolism of uh, Brandon's very colorless and mundane life. He doesn't really have a lot of personal connections to people. He's a single man living in New York City, he works, I guess it's an advertising agency or something like that. And this is the mundane life that he leads. It's a very empty existence. And I think the color scheme for some of these scenes represents that, particularly here as he will go to his routine mastur masturbatory um, exercise, if you will. This shot's very close to uh, 33rd Street. This is actually West 31st Street in New York. Um, very close to the, uh, I guess, Fifth Avenue area. And you notice then the touching again of the uh, uh, record player and the stylus on it, like mean, all these areas of tactility, this touch, this objectifying, these moments of where a human being interacts with an object. And it's done in a very deliberate way. The bottle that gets placed, the uh, laptop and how it's placed and how he opens it in a certain way. And he really doesn't have any more contact with it really, except for just touching a button or a mouse button or two you know, or the, or the mouse pad, the track pad, there's not really a lot of tactile contact between Brandon and the things that he objects, that he uh, touches, I guess. There's not much of that. Behind him is that phone again. It looks like, a, again, it looks like a vibrator. It looks like a, um, again, it looks like a phallic symbol. It looks like a penis being uh, stood up in a holster, really. And you hear the voice of Sissy again, Carrie Mulligan playing uh, the sister to Brandon. She's talking about her brother and saying, look, she's got cancer of the vulva. And it's an unusual thing for a sister to say to a brother. Perhaps, perhaps it depends on how open their relationship is with each other, how close they are, but still not something that you'd expect, which then leads you to think or not whether there's some kind of abusive relationship there somewhere. We see Nicole Bihari there on the phone and we see a daydream sequence here, daydreaming about her being naked. That's Brandon daydreaming about Nicole Bihari. We just see uh, see that, we just see that. I thought that was really nicely done. And we see Brandon kind of daydreaming about what Nicole Bihari would be like with her clothes off. And there she is again on the phone, fully clothed. And Brandon's boss there standing up is James Badge Dale, who um, also plays a role in this movie. And you'll, you'll see how it becomes a somewhat incestuous exercise. But I hope you've seen Shame. I hope you have before listening to me prattle on here. David is the name of the character that James Badge Dale, who goes by the name Badge, to people that he knows, that Badge uh, plays. When you realize you watch this movie, there's never a scene where lots of women are talking to each other. There's only one scene where that happens and that's about to come up where you see a group of women actually talking amongst themselves. And you've got these men transacting and betting that David is going to screw up this interaction with the three women here that you see. And this is the kind of white straight male approach to three white women. He believes he has this confidence about himself to go up to these women, not enough confidence perhaps to be short of making a fool of himself but he kind of goes through this fake it till you make it exercise. 
And Shame is a title of this film, is the title, but it's not limited to the Michael Fassbender character, Brandon. It is something that stretches across the board. I've already talked about the woman in the subway who feels a sense of it. And now the David character played by Badge here, Badge Dale, he is married and he has no compunction about going up to these three women, flirtation abounding. And then it's clear that he's got a foothold here and these three women are interested long enough beyond the uh, offer to buy them drinks that now Brandon comes along and clearly you see how receptive one of the women is to him. And it's the woman closest to him here in this shot. She now says, I'm going to buy all these drinks. They're on me. And that is a very clear indication that she is in control of the situation now. It's no longer David, and quite frankly, it's no longer Brandon either for all of his exploits. He is now uh, no longer in control. He never really was in this scene. It's really the woman here that you see, and she's in the middle of the picture, and the way she's surveying Brandon, she's already sized him up. And I think Brandon already knows that. And Brandon's amused at what his boss David is doing because he knows somewhere it's going to unravel, but he, he laughs at it and he goes along with it. And if you've got one woman also there who finds, finds Brandon to be attractive and asks if, she, if he wants to dance. And you see David now making a complete idiot of himself. <laughs> Danny Terrio, he is not, right? So now we begin to see where the fun... Uh, ends and the serious begins, as Stevie Wonder would say, right? With each beat of my heart is one of the songs that uh, he sang. And uh, there's a time where playing ends and the serious begins. And you see how he's been measuring up uh, a woman who really has her eyes on him right away. David is drunk and we know that David is drunk. And Brandon's called him a cab like any good co-worker would do for his boss. <laughs> and David is <laughs> trying to arrange Brandon in a very strange way. It's this mild homoerotic pull that David has for Brandon because David knows that Brandon is a Casanova. I think intrinsically he knows that uh, in some way, you know. And so now, minutes later, the woman who is, Elizabeth is her name, is been surveying, has been surveying Brandon, now asks him for a ride. And that is a double meaning, of course, as you will now see. And this is the second ride, right? So they're there having sex outdoors at night somewhere under a bridge, presumably in lower Manhattan or wherever it might be. I kind of think that I can't think that they've driven around for too long, but it's obviously a secluded area. This is something that we as human beings do. Many of us, we have sex in all kinds of places and sometimes it's public. And sometimes, you know, you're putting yourself out there that you might get caught. Maybe you don't care. Maybe you want to get caught. Maybe it depends on who you are. Maybe you wouldn't engage in that kind of behavior. Maybe you would. So again, here we see how the monochromatic part of this movie is. Brandon's now coming back into his apartment, which is a very plain and uh, very colorless place. And he's hearing somebody. He's hearing something going on. There's music playing and there's a suspicion that someone's broken in, obviously, to the apartment because he certainly didn't leave the music on and didn't leave the shower running. And so he now is going to have to really consider what his next move is because it could be one that might mean the end of his life or the end of the life of the person who he suspects has broken in. And Sheik, I Want Your Love, I think that's a very timely or very appropriate uh, song to be playing given the relationship between two of the characters. Though. You'll find out who the other one is in the moment here. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> and that's that's Sissy, played by Carrie Mulligan, in the shower. And Brandon, I'm laughing because Brandon is telling Sissy, you know, why would I knock in my own apartment, you know? Um, <laughs> and this is a really interesting thing. This is a brother and sister. The sister is naked. The brother is not. And the brother has a baseball bat. And there's an uneasiness between them. And usually of a certain age, you don't have brothers and sisters um, in this mode together. They don't normally see each other naked. And, and we see that, granted she's in the shower, but again, this is a moment of exposure to Brandon, more so than it is even exposure of Sissy, because he's being confronted now with, I think, something in his past, and that I want your love is a very telling, I think, anthem, but not for the reasons that Sheik performed it, I don't think. Again, the record player and the touching of the record player, the baseball bat, all these objects play this role. Look at the way he... He used the baseball bat to touch this, I guess, this scarf or artifact that Sissy wears. And he does finally touch it with his fingers. And he touches it as if it's a disease. And he kind of smells it and inspects it. And he really doesn't know what to make of it. But it's interesting that he smells her scarf there. Kind of looks like a boa a little bit, you know. Now, Brandon is someone who obviously has an addiction to pornography, at the very least. The kind of pornography, pornography that commodifies women, you know? Pornography that devalues women. I mean, there's actually pornography out there in the world that doesn't, you know? There's usually, if it's run by women, for example, or it's about sex positivity, or it's about... Um, sex positive love um, you can call that porn as well but it's not the kind of porn that is so destructive to women and it's run by women you know it can be run by women and it can be um, viewed in that way through a more sharing experience of sex rather than this male dominated caveman neanderthal type sex that characterizes pornography you know everybody's seen pornography i don't care who you are if you're going to tell me in this day and age that you've never ever seen any form of pornography you are lying to yourself let alone to me but pornography is is very toxic especially this male dominated pornography that reduces women to slabs of meat really and it's not the kind of thing that's very appealing, but yet so many millions of men watch that all the time. And then they incorporate that into what they do. Now, it's something that's very destructive. And instead of communicating to a woman, they communicate through what they've seen in some porn movie. And all that stuff is all choreographed and made up. It's not something that most people in the world experience that way. And when you're having sex, you're not doing things like that in the way they do in pornography movies, although of course that may happen, but not in the way that pornography does it. It's completely without any soul to it at all. And it's very um, guttural and it's just very bizarre to me. But that has wrecked many a relationship and you see this relationship too. I wonder how much these two have had um, some kind of very inappropriate or dare I say incestuous uh, communication and contact with each other, you know? It's the way that she jumps on the back of, of Brandon there, you know? I think Brandon's ashamed of Sissy. I think that's what's happening. I think there's a shame there for him. And we get this first glimpse that Sissy is on some very unstable ground 
and she is kind of t teetering on the edge of the subway platform there. And you know, in New York City, if you're standing that close to the edge of a platform, you're probably either going to jump or be pushed as a train comes. And you saw that Brandon there pulled her back. And so Sissy, who kind of looks like a character out of a Woody Allen movie here in this, mo in this sequence, is testing the boundaries of her own sense of equilibrium, I think. She's on the edge of a platform and she may jump yet, you know, she may jump. I like the way that the subway pole and the door and the foreground, the background match Sissy's red and black hat. You know, you see these red and black uh, lines there, the subway stanchions. And now Brandon takes the hat off. But even in, in the New York City subway, there's a very monochromatic feel. And I love that touch. She puts the hat on Brandon, you know, and I think this is the first moment where they're both very comfortable with each other here as sister and brother. She's begging him to come to this cabaret that she's going to be singing at in New York City. And this is the first time you see a, a moment of comfort and intimacy of, of uh, you know, warmth between them, I think. Brandon at work here, and he's fashionably late, but we know that he's probably been, uh, been masturbating or he's been having sex. And he jokes, but perhaps... You know, maybe it's not a joke at all when he says, well, no, you know, your wife wouldn't let me leave this morning. That he ha probably had sex with his co-worker's wife, <laughs> which he didn't, most likely. That it's probably something he has done with other co-workers' wives, <laughs> for all we know. Maybe the truth is really being spoken in jest. And we see Nicole Bahari there in the background of that scene as she sits at the computer. And we know what Brandon's doing once he goes to that men's room. It's not to take a leak or to do a number two. Shame was shot across New York City, mostly in Manhattan. Now, the vast majority of this was Manhattan, lower Manhattan and midtown Manhattan. And, and this is actually the standard, which is located, there's at least two standards in New York. There's the standard on the west side, the west side highway, and there's a standard, I think, on the upper east side. It's a hotel. It's a swanky, expensive place, upscale. And the standard in downtown on the west side, lower west side, west side highway area, the standard, that has this big space also for cat for this, you know, cabaret, drinking, and, and uh, restaurant. And so that's where they are. And this has got a lot more color to it, even though there's a golden tone. And there's more color in life here. And you see the uh, denizens of New York who can afford it go into the standard and enjoy the nightlife, enjoy the cabaret. You know, this, this film, of course, was pre-pandemic. So you see just how open people are, people are having speakeasies and, and these conversations. And then we get this scene, and this is the scene that in some ways perplexes me, I must say. And I wondered, and I spoke to Steve McQueen, I forgot to ask him about this scene and what it meant to him, because with a few exceptions, such as here, where you see Michael Fassbender and Badge Dale, the next three or four minutes are almost entirely fixed on Sissy here. And obviously when you hold on a character for as long as Steve McQueen does in this particular scene, there is supposed to be some significance there. And Steve McQueen as a director is telling you, the audience, that this is a significant moment. And although I am perplexed by the scene and how long this is part of what we see. 
I think the the reason why Steve McQueen does this is to tell the story of this character. And usually when someone sings Frank Sinatra's New York, New York, it's done with a lot of gusto and confidence and happiness and import. But I think that this is much import, but I think this is much different. There's an irony here because as you can see and hear, Carrie Mulligan sings this not with this joyous, upbeat hopefulness and aspiration. She sings it with a sadness and a uh, disappointment and an irony. And I think that the reason why is because obviously there's something that has affected her deeply. And I do think that the word abuse comes in here somewhere because she's very sad when she sings this, as we can see, there's a sadness about her, even though I think the character is still believing that New York is the place for her, that she can find something there, that she can um, platform her life and springboard it to something even bigger. If you can make it here, you can make it anywhere, right? This is, I think, Sissy's realization that this New York and this experience has been painful for her in some way in her life. She looks right into the camera there. And then she looks straight at Brandon and Brandon knows it, right? Because his eyes are watering up here. He's tearing up and he's about to cry. And, and so there's something there that Sissy is telling him that he knows about, that he's probably repressed deeply in him. And I think he, for the first time, emotes here. There's a sense of shame again. And he knows it, and Sissy knows it. Sissy, Sissy has penetrated him with these words in this song in front of everybody publicly. It's a very naked moment. In fact, I would say it's more naked than Brandon walking around his apartment full, full, full nudity, uh, full frontal. I really think so, because he is now being un un unmasked in some way here, even though he's fully clothed. Whereas early in the film, when we see him walking around naked, in his apartment, he's kind of very uh, uh, stone, stony, you know, st not stoned out, but stony. He's kind of very um, shut down and shut off. And he's going through this routine where he doesn't have to feel anything, but now he's forced to feel something. And also in such an intimate setting, in terms of loads of people around, it's a, it's a place where there's a, it's a very public place, but there's a, it's an intimate space. And she is completely, uh, cutting through him with this song. And she sings it so slowly as well. And she's singing about herself, I think, Sissy is doing. And it's somehow inescapable. I don't think that Brandon can bear this anymore. And I think it's the closest he comes to really expressing his feelings. And there is another time in the film where that actually happens. If you've seen this film, you know exactly what point that's, that is. But here, Sissy's really sending a message to Brandon. Brandon is her older brother. It's just the two of them. We don't know anything about their parents, but we can only surmise certain things about their parents. Perhaps they were parents who didn't love the two of them. Perhaps the parents were divorced and who knows, you know, maybe at an early age, Brandon and Sissy experienced that through their parents. And it was probably a very traumatic thing for both of them. Now she gets a lot of applause and approval for what she just sang. And so Brandon gives his opinion and he kind of is very lukewarm on it. Interesting. Obviously, it's, it was more than that, but Brandon's trying not to express his feelings about it, even though he already has to us when his eyes are watering there. And, you know, Badge here, David, he kind of uh, exaggerates the response Although he certainly was very emotive, he did not have tears streaking, streaming down his face.
Now, Sissy admits that she lives all over the place, so she doesn't have a home. She's essentially homeless. Emotionally, she may not be homeless, though, because she is driving home something that's happened to her. And this is the only time that we really get to know about Sissy and her backstory. There's just a real moment here and people who are Los Angelinos can laugh at it. When when Badge has just asked Carrie Mulligan, well, how do you get around Los Angeles? Because Carrie Mulligan's character says she stopped driving at 16. And Carrie Mulligan's character says, oh, well, I take the bus. <laughs> and you know in Los Angeles that while there is a bus called the Metro and the train called the Metro, you really don't get around that way in Los Angeles unless you are lower income let me just put it that way and you can't afford a car because the vast majority of los angelinos get around uh, the big sprawling metropolis that is los angeles by car that's really the only way to really travel in new york it's not a walk in los angeles excuse me it's not a walking city at all it is a city where you need to have a car and if you don't have a car getting around on metro can be quite tedious and even cumbersome You see, Brandon here is really the object of this scene. And while the two participants in the scene are talking left and right, it's clearly Brandon who sees what's going on. And there's another sense of shame here uh, with the shameless in the backseat of the car alongside Brandon. It's rather incestuous, the close proximity of his sister making out with his boss. I mean, what could be more incestuous than that? Well, there are other things that are more incestuous. But my point here is that these are the two people that Brandon has close relationships with. Perhaps the only two people in his life who had, he has very close relationships with. One is boss who he sees every day and, and the other, his sister, who he's seen naked in his bathtub. And those are two relationships that are close ones. And he now sees those two people in a prelude to sex. And he's sitting there right next to them as a voyeur, unwillingly, but nonetheless a voyeur. I love the interior design here. I love the uh, monochromatic scheme here again. And then we get into Brandon's apartment. And obviously we sense that Sissy and David are going to have sex and they're gonna have sex probably in Brandon's bedroom, right on his bed, which I mean, there you go. That's kind of this act of marking territory for both Sissy and David, you know, David is someone who is now having an extramarital fling, violating his uh, marriage vows, and Sissy is now having sex with Brandon's boss, and doing so in his own bed is kind of Sissy basically saying, F you, Brandon, you know, and there's obviously these levels of harm that are going on. And uh, Brandon is being completely hijacked and, and uh, being attacked by both of these people in this very sexual way, indirectly, of course, because he's not involved in, God forbid, I mean, who would want him involved in that? That'd be the most incestuous thing. I'm saying that he's being attacked, though, here. He's a prisoner in his own apartment because his boss and his sister are having sex in his bedroom on his bed. It just makes uh, the claustrophobia even more acute, as we can see here in this tight space that Steve McQueen has Michael Fassbender in. And you see he wants to just really leap out of his skin here. He's taking off his shirt like this in such an urgent way. And you might think he's going to join them, but he's certainly not going to do that. But he's pulling off his pants. And it makes you think that either he's going to masturbate to them or he's just going to get out of the apartment and uh, thankfully he is doing the latter <laughs> thank god and now the open space gives him some freedom and i love this music from glenn gould here this is a lovely piece from him i forgot the exact name of it but Glenn Gould, who, of course, was an excellent pianist, this is a great scene. He This piece of music works very well with the 
um, jogging pace of Brandon here. And this is on th 30, I think 32nd Street in Manhattan. Either 30, no, it's 31st Street in Manhattan. 31st Street uh, in, in Manhattan, in New York City. And he's uh, running here and he's being tracked. This was done in the early morning hours in New York. And it was an easy shoot because, you know, there wasn't this issue of having to deal with lots of people on the street. And so uh, Brandon's just running at a leisurely jog here. And it's effortless. It works so well with the music that Glenn Gould um, plays here. And then we realize that in a few moments, he will be coming very close to Madison Square Garden, which is the world's most famous arena. And we see that, that Brandon kind of just kind of stops because, of course, there's traffic. And it's the only scene I can think of in this film where Brandon is really not interacting um, so much with the music here, uh, so much with anything that he is just his willingness and desire to get away from something. Because in this movie, he constantly uh, probes things. He constantly chases after things. And this is the one scene where he's running away from something whether it's his sister, his sister, whether it's his boss, this is the only scene I can think of in the movie where he's running away from something. And this is the only scene I can remember where that's happened. Now he's back in this very constricted space. Look at the way the light shows, you know, the light, he's half in darkness, three quarters, two thirds in darkness until he turns on that light. But he's still very much constricted because the lighting doesn't really show his face clearly. So he is someone who is trapped. He's in a claustrophobic space. Uh, David has left. He's changed the sheets here, Brandon, and now he's sleeping back in his own bed. But here comes his sister, who perhaps is half naked, perhaps not, we can't really tell. And she wants to get into bed and she gets into the bed with him. And that's something that's really shows you that there's some kind of incestuous play going on. And Brandon's telling her to get out of his room and she ignores that. She continues to sleep right next to him in his bed after she's had sex with David. And Brandon is just really troubled by it all. And he really gets her the heck out of there and tells her to get the hell out, get the fuck out. And literally, you know, I mean, that's really a, a double meaning in that scene. And we see... The shame is too much here. He's coming with his dark glasses on now, you know? It's the only time we see him wearing dark shades in this movie. He can, you know, he barely uh, really wants to acknowledge his, uh, anybody in the office after what's happened the night before. And obviously his boss has screwed around with his sister. So it's difficult. It's a difficult workplace to come back to after your boss has actually been having sex with your sister. It's it's really it's really insidious because insidious because we see that David is a father too and you know he's married he's a married father of one or two I think two children and he's talking to one of his children on this video chat now and yet you know that you know David is a, a kind of a prototypical man uh, straight white male uh, who and not just straight white men who do this but straight black men do this and straight Asian men, you know, uh, straight brown men who cheat on their spouses. And there are women that do this too, of course, cheating on their spouses. Uh, and that, you know, that's something that is so uh, what we see in the world, right? Um, and the fact is, is that David is shameless. He doesn't have any shame. And there's no real self-reflection at all from David. And he's the boss uh, of this firm that he's in. You might think that he probably runs a very toxically masculine workplace. It's not clear that he does, but someone like that, you would not be surprised if the workplace they were the boss of was a very toxically masculine place, workplace with lots of 
sexual harassment going on against women and men uh, doing some very heinous things to women in the workplace. And the video chat's over with. And again, this fragmentation of the body, you don't see Brandon's head at all. These fragments of bodies. And there's this, uh, this fragmentation of these characters like Brandon. And there's a flirtation here. Nicole Bihari asks if you like your sugar. And then she says, I do. And then she looks at him. I mean, it's a really blatant request. And he's now thinking about what he's just experienced. A part of him looks as if he's in disbelief. And now he's weighing it all here on the West Side Highway, an empty stretch of it. He's actually going to meet Nicole Bahari actually on a date. And he's walking here, Brandon, on the West Side Highway. And he will look up and we will look up in a moment and we will see this. We will see a couple having sex in the high rise that's alongside the West Side Highway. And there you see them there in front of everybody. You know, they're high up, but they're not high up enough where they can't be seen. And it's the voyeuristic moment again for day, for Brandon, excuse me, as he's looking at these two people having sex against the window at night, but everybody can see, you know, it's kind of this, uh, you know, you can't touch us, but we're up here, but here's what we're doing. And we're these exhibitionists and this is what we do. And they look very anthropomorphic. You know, they look like ants. They look like apes, really they look like ants from a distance. And it kind of fits within this world of who Brandon is as a person. He's really very Neanderthalish in a way, Neanderthalish. He's not, I know it's a poor word to use, Neanderthalish is not really a word, but he's someone who's very Cro-Magnon. You know, he's not someone who has a lot of feelings at all. He doesn't process his feelings, which is typical of a lot of men, particularly a lot of straight men of any racial background. The, we don't process our feelings. We don't really uh, sit with our feelings. We don't think about them. You know, we don't express our feelings and how we feel. And that's a real problem. You know, it's a not good thing. I, I love the scene here because Nicole Bahari sits down and she's weighing the appetizers and the, the meals of the day and all. And it all looks very performative for this waiter to be talking about all these things. And, I don't think that Brandon cares. <laughs> Nicole Bahari seems more interested, but she sees that Brandon's kind of very disconnected from the experience because he's not somebody who deals with situations like these very well. He's not good at having a conversation with a woman who likes him and he may be interested in because Sex is his conversation. The actual act of intercourse is his conversation. It's not anything else that really needs to be said for him because literally, and I'll be blunt here, his dick is doing the talking. His penis is doing the talking. And as long as that happens for him, that's his extent of his conversation with a woman. If it's not with his penis, it's his tongue. If it's not with his tongue, it's with his fingers. I mean, that's the conversation. And usually with a woman's vagina. And so... That's the very reductive and objectified way that Brandon operates in a world that's toxically masculine and patriarchal and misogynistic. And so there's no real emotional attachment to Nicole Bahari here. And I forget the character's name that she plays. So I, uh, I'll have to try to bring that to memory, but it's very, very clear that he doesn't really have any emotional attachment to the woman here that he is dating at the moment. And it's the only time that, that 
Brandon gives a compliment, well, you chose wisely on the kind of um, outfit that she wanted to wear for this date. And she looks absolutely lovely. She's so beautiful, Nicole Bahari, and I love what she's wearing here. And uh, one of the things that you see here too that you notice is how much joy that the Nicole Bahari character has. She's very smart. She's very upbeat and, and positive and confident about herself. And, and she's all, she's very wise. You can see the way she's surveying these two men, one of them standing, the other one sitting. And like I say, there's this performative aspect of that waiter. He's kind of, uh, it seems like Steve McQueen may be satirizing the waiter in some way, a New York waiter and how talkative some of them can be. You know, and this is a very uh, swanky restaurant in the lower east side of Manhattan. I love the New York life that goes by the yellow taxi cab that we associate with New York and other cities, but particularly New York. And you see these constant drive-bys, these taxis behind them. So they're really smack dab in the middle of the epicenter of life, which is Manhattan, really, if you're talking about New York. My apologies to Brooklyn and everyone else. I mean, Brooklyn's very lively too, but you know, Manhattan now is such a, a weird place in the way that people can't afford Manhattan anymore. People can't even afford Brooklyn anymore. I mean, both of those places now are extremely expensive and the gentrification in Brooklyn is just off the charts. I think this is the only scene where Brandon does express his feelings about things. But even the expression of his feelings are very uh, abbreviated and truncated. His philosophies about real relationships, he thinks that relationships are very unrealistic. But I love the way that Nicole Bihari challenges him here, you know, because it's really true. She is the truth serum here. And it's very true. She says, well, why are you here? If you don't believe in relationships, why are you here with me? This doesn't even matter to you. Why, we, why do we even matter as people if if you don't think that relationships are worth their while. Now, I do sympathize and empathize with the position that Brandon takes, one person for the rest of your life, really. I mean, yeah, that can be daunting for some of us, but if you believe in being with someone, that's the kind of thing you're gonna have to do. You're gonna have to work at it. Relationships work. Relationships require that you give and take, that you sacrifice, that you are empathetic, that you have patience, that you are able to have a bonding process and you go through those pains ups and downs with the people uh, well, excuse me with the person that you love it might be people for some because some people are in polyamorous relationships some people are in open relationships some people you know do different things as well uh, swinging relationships whatever but if you're doing relationships that are monogamous uh you're gonna have to go through the ups and the downs. It's about being with another person and cultivating something with them. And you do it together so you hopefully grow together. I love this reverse shot of the restaurant. It shows that time has passed, another couple is getting up and leaving, and there we see the backs of Nicole Bihari and Michael Fassbender. And then they leave, and we see them walking down the street. Again, a lot of light has been taken out of these scenes because it indicates that Brand is in this, again, this kind of claustrophobic area. He is out in the open, but yet he's very restricted. And he's, you know, going through this kind of, I think, self-doubt. And he talks about the Neanderthals. I think that's very interesting. He asked Nicole Bihari to touch his hair. And he says it's a remnant from the Neanderthals. And I was just talking to you about how and how much of a Neanderthal uh, Brandon is. And, and yet he, and then he goes and says it. So I didn't even remember that from this movie, but there you go. And that's very clear that I think that's how Steve McQueen casts Brandon here as a Neanderthal. No feeling. It's just this raw guttural grinding of body parts and penises into vaginas and that's it for him there's no affection there's no uh, emotion there's no really anything verbal going on either it's just um the object you know his physical object and a woman's physical object 
and that's it. They're organs and that's it. There's no attachment. And there are people in the world like this. Obviously, Brandon is a sex addict. I'm not passing judgment about him per se, or even about sex addicts. What I'm saying though is that Brandon is very closed in, in a way, so that is a judgment call for me. He's someone who lives in this world that's very truncated about the way relationships occur. And that's true of a lot of people who may be sex addicts or who may not be able to have functioning relationships because there's abuse that's been involved. There's been a lot of dysfunction involved. And, you know, that's something that I think that Brandon, you know, he can't invest in a, a relationship with a woman because he doesn't know how to. He's not been experienced in how to do that. Maybe his parents never did that with each other. Maybe the sissy factor too, he, how he's trying to navigate the relationship with a sister who is obviously going through a lot herself, a lot of pain for her. Marianne is the name of the character that Nicole Bahari plays. And so I'm, I'm going to start to call her Marianne now. Notice the picture there at the back uh, on top of the Delancey Street subway station, Shan Alive. And it's kind of, again, there's a woman who's probably um, maybe taking her clothes off or maybe not. But it seems like it might be to do with, again, it's a woman taking off her clothes, perhaps. Or maybe she's a dancer who isn't taking off her clothes. Yeah, he kind of nods here. Uh, one of the characters' affectations there, that nod that, that Brandon does. I mean, obviously they're going to have another interaction. And there's an incestuousness about that because, of course, they both work together. Co-workers having sexual relationships, not really a good idea, but I'm sure that we've all done it at one point or another. Not all of us, but we we've had that, you know, experience of, um, either having sex with a co-worker or dating them, um, you know, and when that goes south, all hell breaks loose because as they say in the trade, you don't shit where you eat. And having a relationship at work with your co-worker is a problem, especially if you're working in the same department. Now, if you're working uh, in different offices in the same company, or if you're working in on different floors, and that may be, may be not as bad, but still it, it's troublesome. And we see this disembodiment again, this fragmentation of the body, the shame, you know, that the hidden, the hiding of the face and the head there is shame, is the shame that Brandon feels at being caught masturbating by his own sister in the act of doing that. Oh, that's, that is a really rough thing. You know, that's the most intimate thing that people can do is either have sex or masturbate. And to be caught in that moment by your own sibling, that is enough to really make you go off the deep end, I think, or make you just kind of really feel bad. That's a, me a measure of shame again that Brandon's feeling, you know, that this is his personal habit, that someone has now intruded upon, his privacy has been intruded upon and in such a crude way and of all the people who would intrude upon that is his own sister who has obviously been going through a lot of pain herself and it makes him feel very inadequate to know that he's been masturbating like this and it's his own secret nobody knows it and his sister has just completely intruded and gate crashed that moment we've been seeing this throughout the movie he goes to the bathroom in his workplace and he masturbates. He masturbates in the shower. He masturbates in the bathroom and his sister catches him. And it's really a very shameful moment for him. He knows enough to feel shame, but he doesn't know what to do with it. He doesn't externalize that with his feelings in terms of internalize his feelings. He ends up getting more angry. And I think this is very true of men that when shame hits them, they don't absorb it. They don't feel it, they deflect it. And then they continue to run to these very uh, toxically masculine behaviors. They don't sit with the shame and they don't express it. And they don't get in touch with the feelings around shame. They end up, I think, doing more destructive and self-destructive behaviors and destructive behaviors to women as well, especially, rather than investigate the source of the shame and sit with it and deal with it and, and, and be uncomfortable with it. 
we see all these magazines and videos that, that David, that, that Brandon Katz is junking and these laptops and all these things and these, uh, uh, all this stuff that he just reads over and over and over again. He even throws out his dinner and his cooking. He wants to just throw out this version of him. It's as if he's shedding a skin. He's just dumped it. And look at the shame again. No head in this moment, except for now we start to see a part of it. That's this very, uh, very clever disembodiment by Steve McQueen. He's focusing on the body. The mind is no longer there. It's this body. Uh, Brandon, this Neanderthal, as he calls himself, and as I said earlier, and you see it again here, and now he is not processing his shame at all. He's just going straight to Marianne at work, right there. I mean, he's doing, he's really, I mean, they're kissing right there. I mean, right there in the open. I mean, it's in the office. Someone could easily see them, and they could get fired for violating the uh, handbook, the employee handbook. Maybe they don't have an employee handbook at that company that they're working at. I mean, as I said, you've got a boss there who is indulging in all these behaviors that are absolutely inappropriate at the very least. And all these taxes we've seen uh, thus far in the movie, we now see one here, right? And now that has taken them to the Lower West Side, which is this, this hotel, the standard that they're going to. And there's some drug use there from Brandon and Marianne stands there. I love the way they're composed. She is absolutely incredible, Nicole Bahari. Um, pardon me for saying that as a straight man. I am. I just think she's remarkable. Put it that way. I'll, I'll be. I'll be. Uh, I'll, I'll say it in a very decent way, and, and that's the way I will always say it. And uh, you see that uh, Brandon and Marianne here are looking out at the. Uh, skyline there, which looks like New Jersey, West New York, which is in New Jersey across the uh, Hudson there. Now, this is an uh, attempted intimacy for Brandon, and, and you see how Marianne is doing that. She's She actually likes Brandon. She sees him for the flawed individual that he actually is. And she's trying to teach him, I think. She's trying to show him what affection is. I mean, she doesn't have to say it. You can just see it there by the way she's undoing his shirt buttons there. And he's, I think, trying to resist this feeling about her because this is not the way that Brandon normally operates. He normally operates very much in the mode of, I want sex and I want it now and I want to be inside you right now. That's how Brandon works. Now, this is something different for him, something new. I love the shoes, by the way, that Nicole Bahari, Marianne, uh, removes. I like those shoes. She's really surveying him. I mean, this is how I think love is, right? I think this is how you explore. I mean, there's more than one way to explore, but this is foreplay, right? This is, this is how it should be. I mean, there's all different realms of foreplay and different types of it and how long it lasts. But this is, this is what she's showing him. She's, she's navigating this with him, you know, and They joke about her leggings, you know, and, and uh, there's a playfulness there. And I think that Marianne is obviously very attractive, very beautiful, very sexy, very confident with her body and confident about herself. And we see how beautiful she is. I mean, she is absolutely beautiful. And she's very comfortable with her body. I think that Brandon's very uncomfortable with his, though, despite what you've seen. Um, or at least he's very uncomfortable with this moment here. As much as he kisses Marianne and they kiss like this, you can see he's fully clothed still, which tells you something about him. He's not willing to be so naked with a woman who's already half or three quarters naked. And I think here he's not in control. And because 
Marianne is in control, it probably makes him want to now get on top. He wants to be the on top person, as it were, you know, not so much dom sub, dominant submissive, but he wants to be this traditional, quote unquote, traditional missionary male, if you will. And he assumes the position here. This is one of those scenes, again, that Steve McQueen has a long lens, a long camera on. He, the camera doesn't move appreciably. It's kind of like the sissy scene where it stays fixed and the choreography of these two characters as they uh, go through foreplay. One of them is really trying to teach the other and, and the person who um, is the student walks away from it right here. He knows that this is very uncomfortable for him. And there's the shame again. You can't see his head there. You know, the invisible, the disembodiment representing shame for Steve McQueen. I like the way that, again, Steve McQueen does that. And the actor as well, Michael Fassbender. You don't see his head at all there. So he's kind of disembodied. You know, he's only his torso is seen. He's like a blank slate, a slab of meat. And he's really measuring what's happened because he doesn't feel like he can go through with it. And there's a shame there for him. And I think Marianne is hip to it. She's very wise to it too. And she's now instantly going to put her clothes back on. And she's telling him it's okay to um, stop here. It's okay to have feelings, you know. And uh, he doesn't want to deal with this. Again, he can't process this at all. And again... It's not just because I think Brandon's a sex addict. It's because he's a typical male. Most of us as men do not take time of our feelings. We don't. We are so much in a hurry to move past whatever feelings we have because we're taught in Western culture especially to be a man and suck it up and don't have feelings. And I think that's the most destructive thing you can tell any man or any male or any boy is to not have feelings. And all you can see here from Michael Fassbender as Brandon is this, uh, he pauses and thinks about what's happened, but he's already in his own mind. He knows what he's going to do next. And we see this now, what he's about to do next as Marianne walks out the door and says goodbye. This is what he's going to do next. And we see, unsurprisingly, that this will be his next move after he's grappling here with his hands on his head. There's only one move left for him. He's jonesing for this next move. And we all know what it's going to be at the standard as it is there where they are on the uh, West Side Highway. The reality has come in for Brandon. He can't feel. He has no time to. And so this is what feeling is to him. And there they go replicating the scene that Brandon saw earlier, that we saw earlier, of these two people high up having sex in the middle of the day. And you must assume that this is a fuck buddy for Brandon. This particular woman is unnamed in the film. And watch how she will gently, after she touches, puts her bra back on, she will gently, her panties back on, she will touch Brandon on his hair. Uh, you know, the remnant, you know, there you go, the remnant, the Neanderthal. She touches him and then leaves. She doesn't kiss him. They don't kiss. They just had sex and that's it. And then he kind of jokes, well, can I get you a drink? after they've had sex, right? And then she looks around and looks back at him, you know, like, yeah, really? Are you serious? Yeah, that look. And she says no. But this is something they've done before, obviously. And she, I think she's, uh, she's uh, had a problem with her bra here, the hook's odd, she says, and she's trying to, uh, she does fix it in time, her bra. But again, the, 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 interaction with uh, objects and artifacts and this silhouette of Brandon who's still at the hotel long after he has had sex with a woman that he has probably had sex with before he's probably called on her in these minutes and moments before and the, as I say fuck buddies and so she gives him what he wants 
she is quite content as well. So it's a transactional thing. It's not money in this instance, although you never know. But, um, you know, this is something that they've done before. And that's the comfort zone for Brandon, not having the tangible relationship. He doesn't have to talk. He doesn't have to think. He just has to fuck. And that's really who Brandon is. He doesn't have any grounding in emotional moments. They are very uncomfortable to him. And that usually associates itself, I think, with abuse and dysfunction. Now Sissy is back on the couch in, in the apartment and she just wants to have a hug. You know, and now I think Brandon reluctantly does that here. Again, these are one of the few moments, one of the few moments in the movie where Brandon actually puts his arm around a woman. You know, he puts his arm around his sister here. He's very uncomfortable hugging. But... I like the way that this shot from the back, you know? And they're obviously talking about Brandon's boss. And there's this contempt that Brandon has. See, he's judging and, and, and she picks up on that, this sissy, why are you fucking angry? Why are you so fucking angry? And this is a topic of conversation, you know, because there's obviously been this history between Sissy and Brandon. We're not exactly sure what it is. But obviously, Brandon doesn't like it. Having his boss um, screwing his sister, not something that um, was on his bingo card. And as a result, they have it out here. You know? And I think that you can't believe Sissy when she says, you realize that he has a family. And she can't possibly think that he doesn't. She must have seen that wedding ring. But this isn't about the family. This is about something deeper. Maybe it's about Sissy and Dave, uh, Sissy and Brandon more than it is anything else. Because really it's the two of them are operating in these very different ways around these behaviors. She's not a sex addict, but she has no uh, problem with sleeping with a man whom she knows is Brandon's boss. And is, again, I, I think it's this, this fuck you, this F you, uh, from Sissy to Brandon, kind of like this marking of her territory uh, by having sex in his bed. And I think that's really, I think, a message she's sending. And I think his uh, feeling around all this, and it could be an incestuous thing, where is that he just continues to seek sex. He doesn't deal with his feelings. He doesn't process them. As I've said before, he just keeps fucking them out, if you will, for lack of a better terminology. I just think that you have to talk about this movie in that way. And I think that it's very clear with what's going on, that these two souls are searching for each other as much as they are searching for themselves and for searching for the meaning that they have. Sissy's a very detached character because she has these experiences that have left her profoundly unhappy and, and no one really seems to want to listen to her. And the one person in the world who had the potential to listen to her is her own brother, Brandon, and he's not listening. And in fact, he's rejecting her here. And she's looking for someone to not validate her, but just listen to her. And Brandon just rejects her with this speech here. We're family, she says, but he doesn't, uh, he doesn't see it that way. Now he gets physical and violent with her here. He's totally rejecting her and he's being violent toward her here too. See, he reacts with anger because again, he can't process his feelings. And so he is, he's put into this position where he has to sink or swim and he can't deal with confronting what's going on. So he has to be violent. And that's what so many men do. They can't process their feelings. They won't process their feelings. And they think that the best thing to do, the culture tells them, the patriarchy and the toxic masculinity culture tells them is to be violent. And rather that than actually open up yourself to looking at your feelings and sitting with them very uncomfortably and exploring that and, and how much that will cost. What is easier for lots of men is violence. 
against women. And that's the reality here. I don't want to talk, you know, and that's what men do. We shut up shop, most of us, you know, we, we shut up, shut up talk. We shut up shop and we don't talk anymore. We just sit there. But you see, both of these two people, both of them are very unhappy. Yeah, and, and, and City unloads a very telling line that you have me and your sex pervert boss. And she slept with him, you know. And the, the irony is, though, is that she's right. Brandon does not have anybody. He's extremely lonely and isolated in a city of 8 million stories or 9 million stories or however many millions of people populate New York City right now. He is he's very isolated. And that's the point, I think, by the way you see the monochromatic stylization of the film for Brandon. He's very closed off. He's, you know, claustrophobic, but he doesn't have anybody. And I think Steve McQueen illustrates that, you know, how lonely Brandon is in New York City, even though he's been able to um, have sex with one woman after another, he's extremely lonely. And we see how lonely he is. Uh, and you see how desperately lonely he is based on what you see in the rest of this movie and what he will do to achieve some sense of, of uh, togetherness with people, people. But he's doing it for a very singular reason, sex, to fulfill this void in his life. And the thing is, he thinks that the sex is going to be the thing that fulfills this gaping wound. But he knows better deeply, I think, in his heart that having sex, that every everyone you have sex with in the world is not going to fill your your the void in your heart. You know, that's not filled by sex. It's a temporary thing. It's like a drug. And so he thinks the sex is going to cure whatever this is. But now he's going to find out that it's going to get a lot harder for him. <laughs> no pun intended. But he's spotted a woman in a bar who looks very much flirtatious. There's this, look at this man standing up against a wall. We don't know what that is yet. But these are all memories and recollections. This is not all happening in real time. We see here that this particular woman is up for whatever it is that Brandon's advertising and we know what it is. And this happens, this happens. There are many occasions, not just in New York, but anywhere in the world where women and men do this to each other. They will basically cheat in front of their spouse for whatever the reasons are. You see that she really likes this and you see how Brandon's touching her I mean, he's literally putting his fingers inside her. We don't see that for sure, but we can only surmise it from the camera shot. We also notice that Brandon's got this scar on his uh, left cheek, or really his, his, uh, his left cheek there. And we're wondering how the heck that got there. But again, as I said, this all happens in rotations of time. This does not happen all at once. These are all recollections. So we're seeing these fragmented uh, parts of this character coming together. And we see that when we go back to the subway shot here, he's thinking back, right, to something that happened before. And some very, very explicit dialogue there about the lot. He likes the way that it's just him and this particular woman's vagina. And he's beginning to um, get very explicit with her here at the bar. And that's the kind of thing that some men do. You know, they are very explicit about this to a complete stranger. And I'm sure that many women can account for that experience. And it's unwanted, I think, in the vast majority of occasions. Now, of course, that is the man that she's with, her man there, if you will. Um, and... This is the thing that seems like a fantasy in New York, but it's a very cold reality. Um, there are these people who want to get into this club and he's trying to get into this club and he's pretending that he's 
on the phone, but he's trying to get in this club and he won't be allowed in. And the reason why is because it's couples only. And the bar, the, the bouncer is sitting there, just standing there telling him, not tonight, not tonight. This is not your night to come in here. And that bouncer, no doubt, recognizes that he's been there before. And now he's trying to go in there and get women, obviously, and it's probably couples night only. And now this is the uh, really kind of comical fantasy nightmare here where he's actually telling the boyfriend and basically the cuckold um, what he wants to do with the woman that's standing right next to him, do, doing to the woman that he's with. And he plays along with it, but it's, it's a contemptuous play along for the other man. And it's kind of this male male to male uh, with female in between them, you know, the, this menage a trois, this threesome that happens. But it's a crude threesome because nothing ever happens between the three of them. But we see that there's this sickness um, that Brandon has and now he's going to get beat the crap out of, you know, uh, this toxically masculine response. And that's where you get to see here how he got the scar, the bruise from. He's getting the, the crap kicked out of him. There's this man again. He's kind of this stranger of this place called Quo. Now, I think that's some kind of sex club. I don't know if that really exists in New York anymore. I mean, well, sex clubs exist in New York, I'm sure. But Quo, I don't know if that particular place exists anymore. Maybe it does. Um, because Quo is actually a nightclub. Um, and, uh, and, uh, from what I've learned, it, I think it's a gay club, but, um, the point is, is that Brandon now is after being rebuffed from going into this club where there are, uh, women, straight women and straight men, he now is going into this, uh, and it's portrayed, I guess, as a hellish underground. Uh, he's going into this, into this gay men's club. And he is, I don't know if he's having shame around that or not. As a sex addict, the point that's being made by Steve McQueen is that you will go anywhere to have sex. It doesn't matter with whom, it doesn't matter where. Um, and you see these men going down on each other and, and having sex with each other. And so now that man that's been glimpsed is now the man that he's going to have sex with. And you can see it here. And, um, you know, Michael Fassbender has now just shoved him down to go down on him and to give him a blowjob, which you obviously can surmise is happening there. And, you know, the way that this is bathed in red like this, it's kind of like this danger, danger. But I don't think that the sex that Brandon has there should be scandalized that way. The fact that the lighting is red seems to indicate that cinematically. And I don't know if Steve McQueen is trying to do that, but I don't think there should be any distinguishing between the sex that Brandon has with a straight woman and the sex that he's clearly having with a gay man. I don't, I don't think that the film should distinguish there. And I think that perhaps maybe if, um, you, if there was a director who was doing this and was a, a member of the LGBTQ community, I think that the director would not have made that stylistic choice. That's just me as a straight man talking. I think that Steve McQueen as a straight man has made that choice to distinguish this behavior that Brandon has when he really shouldn't because it's really about this addict and this addict will go anywhere to get sex, anywhere. That's what that whole point is. And I think it kind of gets undercut by the stylization but Steve McQueen is a master of stylization. We see that here as well. Again, he focuses on bodies and, you know, bodies that like we don't see the faces of these women very often. We do a couple of times, a few times, but we don't see them fully, really. We just see them as bodies interacting with each other and all three of them there in the, in the threesome that I think Brandon really wants. We see nipples and we see breasts and we see you know, the sensual, the neck, that can be a very erotic place. And we see these bodies and, and we see the Michael Fassbender character, Brandon, and he is back where he probably wants to be. But there's an intensity about this scene, this threesome, this menage a trois that becomes so, I think, irrelevant in a way because it, it, Brandon disappears here. 
he's totally disappeared and we see the bodies um, being humped and, 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 and fucked and, and, and sucked and caressed and, and uh, touched, but there's no meaning to this anymore. And you see this Neanderthal, Brandon here, really at his Neanderthal worst. And you hear the score from uh, the composer, Harry Escott. And, you know, these women's breasts are jingling, jiggling, and, and the camera's all out of focus at times. And you can clearly see that it's all bodies humping now. There's nothing else going on. You know, it's like a slab of meat. And we see uh, Michael Fassbender pounding away here. He's going down on this one woman. He's eating her out and he's doing all these things to her. And it's just all meaningless. It's simulated sex. It's not real sex. But of course, the actors uh, make it look real, make it appear real. And the director does as well. And they're certainly kissing and there's fondling and everything. But, you know, there's nothing else going on here. It's just... It's an emptiness, it's a void that Brandon disappears into with these two women. And the two women are on a different wavelength. They're obviously enjoying themselves, but I don't think Brandon is. You can see here, he's so raw and pained and he's just really fucking himself into invisibility because he's so ashamed of himself. And you can see he's not enjoying this as much as you might think he is. But the two women are very much enjoying each other. Now he's, you know, fragmented from his own sexual experience here. That's a really powerful scene, by the way. And again, these are all happening in recollection moments. These are all things going on in his mind. You know, he's had these experiences and he's remembering them. And there's this odyssey that he's taken here. And he's just totally, totally um, divorced from himself. He can barely live with himself now, I think. The subway train is different now for him. There's a problem that happens. You know, the subway journey is kind of a metaphor. Brandon's hit a wall and the subway train ride has hit a wall as well. The subway's hit a wall. He's not, he's stalled and the subway train is stalled. And I think this is the moment of crisis for him. He's come up to this moment where he's trying to evaluate what the next step is in his life. Yeah, that's the standard in New York, the police investigation moment, you know, that we have seen too often in New York in a subway train stop in a, on a platform or in a tunnel. And now everyone has to be let out. I kind of think of the taking of Pelham 1, 2, 3 when I see this scene, you know, when the conductor tells them all to get off the train. And when the hostages get taken too, it kind of, we're all hostages of the New York City subway in some way, shape or form, when someone comes up to you and you can't escape, you know, or when the panhandler comes up to you, you kind of want to ignore that person, but you know, you really can't, can you? Unless you choose to do that because this is New York and you can't run away from this and run away from the fact that we've got a system of inequity that creates poverty that creates ignorance, that creates sex addiction in a way, that creates abuse, that um, informs this misogyny, that creates misogyny that oppressive, oppresses women, oppresses black people, brown people. And now I think he's waking up to the reality that Sissy is in some distress and he's running, uh, running desperately to come to this moment because he knows that Sissy's in trouble. And there's gonna be a very unsettling scene here coming up in a few moments that, again, it's a moment that Steve McQueen prolongs with his camera being fixed on this moment. And uh, it's something that, it's difficult to watch, but it's a scene that's there because it's this moment where we realize that Sissy's cry for help is no longer a cry, it's an act. And it's an, a desperate act because she is, feeling ever more rejected. And because of all the history that's gone on now, we don't really get an articulation of what the history is between these two characters, but we know or suspect that there's abuse and dysfunction, and there clearly is. But whatever help signal, distress signal that 
uh, Sissy's been crying throughout this entire movie, has gone unanswered. Uh, as I said earlier, Brandon has absolutely ignored her. And so she now is going to do something that forces him to pay attention to her. And unfortunately, it's, it's this act of uh, self-harm, self-harming. And, uh, you know, that's a really, really shocking moment where you see all this blood and, and uh, you know, Sissy has been self-harming. And, uh, and we hear the music of Glenn Gould playing over this horrific moment. And there's this ironic uh, contrast, you know, Glenn Gould's piano. And then you see, you know, this horrible moment here where Sissy has resulted resorted to this uh, violence against herself. It's, uh, it's a really painful thing. Um, it's, it seems a bit melodramatic, but it's entirely predictable given what we've seen. This character's trying to say something to Brandon. And when you can't even get the attention of your own brother, then you really perhaps feel in this place where you have no choice but to do what you do here in this moment. And by the way, if you feel like doing this, there are crisis hotlines to contact so that you can really talk to someone, have someone talk to you and talk you away from doing self-harm. Whether you are in the United States or any other country, there are people who can help you. And so I want to just say that because I think it's appropriate to say that at this moment, that uh, you know you don't have to resort to this. There are ways out even though you think there may not be. People do love you, even though you think that they are ignoring you. And I think that in this moment, Brandon realizes that he has some work to do. He has to start to feel. And I think that Sissy's act of self-harm forces him into uh, trying to do that and for the first time in his life, perhaps. You see that the marks there in the wrist and you see that uh, the bleed through and all those times she's self-harmed. It's not the first time, you know, and he's trying to touch that. He's trying. This is the first time he's trying to do this with a human being, touch these scars of hers. He's been touching record players. He's been touching needles for records. He's been touching all kinds of things. And you see she's, her eyes are open, you know, and she, she admonishes him there with the shithead. And he's trying to feel for the first time, you know. And he just, you know, he's trying to, he's trying to uh, feel. And this is someone who's had all this sex, but I, I contend that he's not felt a thing in his life. He, he has the orgasmic release, but he doesn't feel anything. He doesn't feel anything before, during, or after having sex, having intercourse. He doesn't, I don't think his character ever feels anything. He doesn't have any grounding at all. And I think for the first time here, he's finally getting some sense of that. He's trying to, and you see the monochromatic outdoors, right? This very grayish, greenish, whitish, bluish look. And it is accentuated by the uniform, the costume that he's wearing here, Brandon, the, the fast is wearing. And it's all like this, he blends into the background, he blends into the nothingness. And he could just as be one of those two towers, like the standard in the back on the right hand side of the screen there, which is where, you know, where he was having sex with the fuck buddy, so to speak, and where he also was with David and with Sissy in the cabaret area and that big bar. And now he's kind of felt the whole weight of all these moments, the shame and, and everything comes cascading down on him, including the rain. And he allows himself to actually feel and emote really deeply here. And it's a cathartic moment for him. It's also a moment of reckoning. I think Brandon here is realizing now how hurt he has been, how abused perhaps he has been and how empty he has been his whole life. And the sex is a way of trying to run away from the pain in his life. I think that's my take on it. Brandon now, and I don't know if this is weeks later or days later or anything, 
but he's at 28th Street now waiting for the subway to come in and he looks completely different and he looks much more I think in control of himself it looks like there's a woman in the background kind of looking at him from afar and then she kind of walks toward the subway do you see that in the background there very interesting now on the subway train he's gonna be sitting in a reverse really kind of a uh, i guess symmetrical um bookend to the beginning of the film and now brandon's kind of looking around and oh look who he sees look who he sees it's the very same woman except she looks really different kind of an exaggeration here in a way and the red lipstick is even more firmly red and he's not looking at her the same way he doesn't regard her the same way as he did at the beginning he is perpetually looking down and looking up at her and he's kind of got this caution written all over his face and she's the amber she looks completely amber colored look at the the clothing is amber colored golden amber and of course the wedding ring there again she's got no shame here there's no uh off switch here for her she unlike the first time where she was kind of contemplating and then she said oh no i've got to shock myself back to the reality of being a married woman this time she has no shame and he does and and he kind of stares and stares and it's kind of like a to be continued moment you have to think that brandon does not get off that train and follow her he probably stays on the train at this point michael fassbender was excellent wasn't he and Kerry Mulligan was very good too, as was James Bashdale, and also particularly Nicole Bahari there as Melanie, I think her name was. Steve McQueen directs. Steve McQueen's done some very good films. Hunger was a very good one, very visceral. Dealing with the body, all these themes in his movies deal with the body, the physicality. He did a film called Widows as well, uh, as well, that starred Viola Davis. And he has since directed other movies, including a real good anthology about growing up in England in the 1960s and 70s. I really urge you to watch that. And of course, he's done other movies as well. Joe Walker, the editor. I got to talk to Joe Walker a few years back now. A really good guy. And uh, all of the people who made this film did it well. I think Shame is a good movie. Harry Escott, the composer. I think it's a very good movie. And... It's a very powerful movie, an intense movie. It's not a movie for everybody. As I said, it's NC-17, but it's not a movie that will be typically a person's cup of tea. You wouldn't go on a first date to see this movie, I don't think. <laughs> but I do think it's a movie that has some importance to it. It does highlight the addiction because that's what the film is about more than anything. Sex just happens to be that addiction. It could be drugs. It could be something else, right? It could be food. It could be some sugar. It could be... You know, it could be anything, right? But in this case, it's sex. And that's the one thing that we in Western society just, we just lose our marbles over. Oh, sex, woo! We just can't stop ourselves, right? We just go off the cliff. We, we sometimes get very juvenile in Western culture about sex and about how we react to it and respond to it and what we do. And we are all kind of very, I don't know, it's a very immature way to deal with things. But the Western culture is such the patriarchal, white patriarchal culture is all about uh, this kind of shaming. And the thing is, sex is something that is to be treasured, is also to be explored. And if you're someone who believes in non-monogamous relationships, you should be able and entitled to explore those to the extent that you feel comfortable doing it. And if you're not, if you're someone that's into monogamy, then you should be able to do that to, to your comfort zone as well. But if you're someone like Brandon, who is single, and doesn't want non-monogamy and doesn't want monogamy. He just wants to be a free agent who can just go around and fuck everything that moves for lack of a better word, then you're in a different place. And then you then are inevitably isolated. And you are at that point really trying to escape from yourself. And you're not really dealing with the outside world anymore. You're dealing with yourself, but you're not confronting yourself.
It's very interesting. I mean, I can go in so many different directions with this. Um, and I do thank you very much indeed for listening to this particular audio commentary of Steve McQueen's film. I am really, uh, it's a great pleasure to actually be doing this particular film because I, I like it a lot. You know, there's, there's things that you ma may watch in this film and you may actually identify with when you watch this film. You know, I think that in some way, every one of us has had moments, not exactly like these perhaps, but moments that could lead to these moments that you see in shame. And I think in that way, there's parts of this film that we could possibly identify with. Maybe some of us can identify with Brandon because maybe some of us are sex addicts. I don't know. You know, I'm not a sex addict personally. I do think though that there are, there are traits of Brandon that are in all of us, particularly all of us as men, this wanting, this desire, women too, this desire. Um, but I don't know if that should lead to sex addiction. I don't necessarily think it has to. You know, there's one place that we're in and one place that Brandon's in. But I want to thank you very much indeed for watching this and listening to me. And my name is Omar Moore. I'm a film critic. You can find me on Twitter at the popcorn R E E L. Thank you and 